is a live broadcast as a live broadcast you've got any questions about anything you can ask them it doesn't have to be about the subject of the video uh, which I'm doing at present and uh, today uh, I'm going to talk about the great escape uh, uh, and the aftermath of the great escape more, more the, the aftermath of the great escape rather than the great escape itself and uh, so you've probably seen the film you've certainly seen the film everybody's seen the film uh, 1963 film with uh, Steve McQueen and um, Richard Attenborough and this in my opinion is one of the all-time greats as far as war films are concerned uh, incidentally I forgot to mention this two days ago when I did the uh, video on Mussolini um, I would have given a plug for a film which is really which I think is really good but got dreadful reviews and that is the film Mussolini and I uh, starring Bob Hoskins as Mussolini uh, Chano is Anthony Hopkins and Susan Sarandon as a uh, uh, Ed, Ed, um, uh, Ed, 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 Ed Chano's wife. I think that's a brilliant film, and it's uh, even though it's got a bit of corny commentary, uh, but it, it to me it's uh, it, it's it's very historically accurate, and it's the best thing Anthony Hopkins has ever done. Anyway, to come back to the Great Escape, the Great Escape is largely uh, historically correct. They had to change the names for a legal reason, which I've now forgotten, and. Um, uh, also, uh, but but showing how things happened uh, there is actually accurate. At the end, though, it's no, that isn't accurate. Uh, so so the, what happened is that the prisoners uh, who escaped and um, uh, and then they were killed, but they weren't killed together as shown in the Great Escape film. Now, um, so what happened was the following: so that the uh, there was a uh, the POW camp. And now it seems, there seems to be some doubt as to how many people actually got out. Uh, numbers are quoted of being 73, 76, 78 and 80. The figure 80 was actually used in the trials of those that actually killed, uh, killed the prisoners. And so, uh, so it seems to be, the doubt seems to be is how far out is out. Um, effectively, I would have to say that they were 76 that got out. That's my opinion, uh, because um, <laughs> hello Noel, uh, so that because uh, um, we know that uh, 23 were captured. Uh, sorry, sorry, 23 survivors. Uh, there were three uh, who escaped, and 50 were murdered by the Nazis. So, so that that's what I would look at. But there were people who were caught uh, at the getting out the coming out the tunnel at the very uh so as well maybe they weren't actually included in the numbers because they were they got them uh, immediately so um the idea for the great escape goes to march 1943 roger bushel who was played in with a different name by uh, richard attenborough in the film um he'd been escaping from all sorts of places he was from south africa uh he'd, he'd been a lawyer before the war, and he was captured in uh, May or June 1940 uh, near Dunkirk. And so, so he, in fact, he was uh, his plane had crash landed, and he was just sort of sitting by the plane. He thought the people, uh, he sort of somebody sent a car for him. Only it is um, uh, the car that uh, was sent for him uh, was not by <laughs> it wasn't British or French or Belgian. Uh, it was German, so that's how he ended up in escaping from all sorts of, of, of places. Um, anyway, so he was the big X, uh, and uh, he was the person who organized everything. And uh, so they, they, the prisoners got out. Now, uh, they got out in, in, uh, in winter. Uh, it was the end of March, but there was snow on the ground. Now, the idea, there was then an escape season. Uh, because the the thing was, whereas you wanted it to be dark at night so you could get out and give you a bit of time, but obviously you had to sleep out. And if uh, even today, for example, uh, if you sort of said to somebody, they'll go, yeah, we'll go, we'll go camping or something in the winter, uh, you wouldn't be too pleased about it. And that's having all the kit. Bear in mind that in many cases they didn't have the kit. Uh, and in, for example, in the book. 
uh, which the the the, uh, the 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 film was based on. Uh, it, the, there's a uh, they say that the the, the uniforms on such bad conditions that sometimes you could even see people's uh, bottoms. Uh, it was it because they, they didn't have uh, the equi uh, the clothing, and many people so these were from RAF and if they most of them got out by parachuting out and uh, when they had to parachute out obviously they had no kit on them and uh in, in many times the the uniforms uh, in in you know because of planes on fire or something and then the, the the uniform is not in very good condition uh as they land so that was the uh, that was a situation uh that 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 many were in However, nonetheless, they managed to put together lots of civilian clothing, and uh, which helped them. Now, the way it was done, the original idea was to get 250 people out, but uh, it was done in a sort of a, a way that the people had the best chance, got the best stuff. So, uh, so if you, for example, if you knew the language, uh, you were good at geography, uh, you you uh, contributed to the tunnel, uh, then you'd be put up. Um, to, towards the front somewhere, so I suppose I'd have been lucky, and well, okay, maybe it wouldn't help much with the tunnel, but I, I knew the other the other two things. Um, and then uh, uh, you got the, the, the those at the front got the best kit, and so obviously there wasn't enough kit for everybody to go around. And uh, the the food that they took, the emergency rations, called them iron rations, and they were they. One of the things about POWs was this, is that the POWs got uh, food parcels uh, from the Red Cross and they often ate better than the Germans. And so so the thing was this, when you got, you see in the film, for example, the Germans being bribed and that was the case. Uh, they would, it, it, it was the, the POWs themselves who were bribing uh, their guards. So that was how they managed to get all sorts of stuff from them. So uh, they escaped and what happened was the following day, 26th of March uh, 1943, uh, Hitler learns of this and he goes berserk. He's a, he was then at uh, Berchtesgaden and did I say 43? It was 44, sorry, 20, uh, 26th of March 1944. Uh, I might have said 44, just had the idea I said 43. Um, the, so Hitler goes berserk. And he demands that they all get shot. And then, then there's an argument, above all, with Goering. And uh, it says that, no, no, you can't go You're doing that. They'll retaliate on ours, our, uh, ours in their hands. I very much doubt they would have done that, but uh, that's, uh, that's what was argued. And so, anyway, so there's an argument there uh, with K uh, Keitel and, uh, Keitel, sorry, and, um, uh, and uh, in a, a number of over half, is agreed on over half of the prisoners are to be shot now uh, when people escape from pow camps you've got to understand i think what the objective was and the idea that they could get back home was highly unlikely so um I think for most of them, what they had in their minds was, oh, it'd be a bit of an adventure. Uh, bear in mind that many of these people sort of public school people and they sort of they saw life like this as being uh, because of the, the flyers. And uh, so they had this, the, the, um, the, the, this, this was part of what they were with army that I very much doubt that you'd have found people who wanted to, to constantly escape because they came from... Um, they wouldn't have seen all this as a bit of a, an adventure and a wizard prang to use the language of the time. Um, so, uh, so that's that an adventure and also an adventure which had a really good positive effect for the war effort, and that was to tie down enemy resources because if they they've got police and all all sorts of other people out looking for them, they're not doing other things and so therefore it took resources away that was the whole idea indeed in 1943 uh, there were sort of posters put up in in pow camps that saying that uh, it's not a um uh, it, it's not a game and the times when uh, german troops may have to shoot to kill uh pow's who are on on the run and um, they treat many of them certainly did treat it as a game. Now, 
uh, Hitler goes berserk. He orders the people to be killed. So what are the, the stages in this? Right. So the person, the order goes to Himmler. Himmler then tells the head of the criminal police. That's called Kripo. Uh, so the criminal police was separate, a separate institution from the Gestapo. Uh, and so the criminal police office in Wrocław or Breslau as it was then, gets the order to uh, shoot those prisoners who have escaped, who are recaptured after interrogating them. It's then put out all over Ger not just Germany, because uh, it was parts of, for example, uh, some um, the Gestapo in Zlin in occupied Czechoslovakia also uh, was uh, informed of it. Okay, even here in the okay, this was uh, uh, Gdansk, uh, Gdansk Free City, um, then annexed to uh, the Third Reich. It came here as well, and so these orders go out. Uh, to capture them and not net the, the, the photographs of the prisoners who had escaped appeared in the official police gazette and so the, uh, all police officers would have had access to the photographs of these escaped prisoners now um, it was pretty difficult though for them to escape first of all as I said earlier didn't have the kit most of them didn't speak the language uh, most of them had no access to currency now in some prison of war camps they had some uh, like this POW camp um, money and that money could be uh, exchanged for other services in in this one here in Zagan um, uh, Zagan <laughs> Some Polish word, Sagan. Uh, they, um, they, the, the, the money didn't exist. I don't know why. Um, but having German money was a uh, would get you into really big trouble. But they did have some German money because that's how they managed to buy um, the uh, train tickets and all the rest of it. And there was also problems with buying train tickets. One of the problems they had was getting to the railway station, Jagan, because of the blackout, there was a tunnel to get into it from the so you'd have to walk from the camp and then get and they couldn't find the tunnel many of them so many of them actually missed the play the, the the trains they were supposed to get and because of the difficulty in getting people out it didn't go as planned in fact there was one hour where they only managed to get one person out um so uh and also the tunnel wasn't long enough as well as is as demonstrated very clearly in the film uh so so they were um get getting out was difficult not only that they had to carry something with them as well because uh, the um the they had to have a bit of clothing a bit of uh, something to eat so i had to carry it somewhere now uh because of the amount of foreigners in germany at the time people who were doing work uh not 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 just people who've been the ostarbeiter but there was plenty of people even from france and italy and other countries and so therefore in a way that made it slightly easier to actually uh, hide amongst them also for example roger Bus bushel uh who spoke uh, fluent french he could pretend to be french and he, he, he could pretend to be working for a uh, a French company. So there were people who did things like that in an earlier escape, uh, which had happened uh, from uh, from the same camp. The Norwegian person he pretended that he was uh, a representative of a margarine producing company, company based in Norway, and he, he was uh, in Germany on business. Uh, so they, they could find things of this nature, which actually helped them get away. So. Uh, they uh, they scattered all over the place, uh, and uh, they were recaptured la in well, as far away. Roger Bushel was captured in uh, Saarbrücken. Um, uh, the people captured uh, in Kiel, in Stettin, Zlin, uh, uh, but most of them were captured in the region of Breslau or, or cl very close to the camp because they couldn't get very far. Um, so. Um, now, uh, the orders had gone out to kill these people uh, uh, and some of them. Now, the person who appears to have made the dis decision to do the killing was Arthur Niebuhr, who was head of the Kripo in Berlin. Niebuhr is a rather 
strange character. He worked for the police. In 1933, he decided that he didn't want to work for the police because he didn't like the Nazis. However, in uh, 1941, he commanded an Einsatz uh, commando uh, and he was murdering Jews in the Baltic states. So mass murdering, not just mur one or two, but we're talking here of tens of thousands of people. Uh, he came back after this uh, to do a sort of a desk job in Berlin. And then he was uh, he was in the opposition. He was now plotting against Hitler. So at the time that he was making this decision, who's going to live and who's going to die, uh, he was actually cooperating with the planned coup d'etat against Hitler. In um, 1996, I had the uh, I was very lucky to, to meet the prosecutor in Poland who was dealing with this case. It was still an open case, uh, although the, uh, well, it was an open case, but it was in the pending uh, tray. And uh, in fact, he gave me he gave me some documents uh, and um, uh, on, 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 on it. Unfortunately, he died. In fact, he died a few days after I, I, I met him. I went back to see him. And uh, the people didn't know how to tell me that he was dead. They couldn't say it to me directly to the fr in my face. And they, they used all sorts of, um, well, he's not here. He won't be coming back. This this type of thing. They couldn't. And, and, and my responses were, um, uh, obviously, I didn't take the hint. Anyway, sorry, come off the point of it. Um, so, but he explained to me, he said he heard that when they had Niebuhr, uh, he's going through the documents. Oh, he's too young, that one. Oh, we'll let that one live. There was a couple of let off because they had names that were thought were of famous people. Churchill and Nelson. Well, they said they could be relatives of the Admiral or the, or the British Prime Minister. We better not kill them. If you look at the people who survived, nearly all of them are British. Nearly all of them. If you look at the people who died, who were murdered, uh, they're all, uh, well, no, no, sorry, the majority are British. Uh, tw of the 50, 20 are British. But there's 30 who aren't. So they come from all sorts of other countries, you know, from Norway, from Poland, even one from Argentina, from South Africa, from New Zealand, from Australia. And it's as though they have deliberately tried to kill the non-British ones. Only one uh, who wasn't British uh, survived, and he was from Czechoslovakia. So... Uh, the decisions were made like that to kill them. Now, so the, it's gone from um, uh, Himmler to uh, Niebuhr and then it gets passed on to all the Gestapo officers. Now, I'll deal with, just tell you one particular example. Uh, in Kiel, uh, in um, northern Germany, uh, the Gestapo there got the order. Four people were arrested at the railway station that the, the police officer noted that their coats didn't look right uh, they'd been dyed but they hadn't been dyed very well so he uh he arrested them uh, on just on suspicion and then it turned out they were allied uh, fight, uh, um, uh pilots uh, one of them uh from uh new zealand he spoke fluent german but the others uh, the, other, the two uh, one was from australia one's new zealand the other two were from norway and um anyway so they took them for interrogation uh today i had the the file out uh, with the uh, the interrogation and the photographs um of them and then what they the, the thing was they probably realized they weren't going to get anything particularly useful out of them interrogation and then what they did was they told them they had to go back to the camp. We'll go in the car. Uh, and uh, they didn't go very far. They said, well, look, well, it's going to be a long way. and better, you better, you better get out and urinate. Uh, now, in the first car, there was somebody called Johannes Post, a stormbound Führer in the SS. He was also a criminal commissar. And he told uh, the New Zealander to get out. And it was just him. Uh, um, there was the driver, there was an a a NCO, and there was the uh, post in the car with the with the prison. He got out to urinate and he, uh, shot him in the back. And this now the other car pulled up, which is coming from behind. In it was um, the boss of uh, post, whose name Schult Schultze or Schultz. Can't remember. I've forgotten. Should have looked it up before I started. Anyway, never mind. Schultz and. Um, uh, and he was there with a driver and uh, three prisoners. And um, now they, they said the same thing. So they went into this place, there was a gate, but then they saw the dead person. Uh, they tried tried running 
and they were all shot, uh, shot in the back and killed. Now, um, the news of the shooting got out quite quickly. Now, the point of doing this was to act as a deterrent so other Allied prisoners wouldn't try escaping en masse anymore. And uh, so this was uh, this was broadcast the camp. It was the, the chief officer uh, in the camp, uh, um, uh, um, flight, flight uh, was it, wing, was wing commander Massey, and um, uh, he uh, he was informed that 41 people had been killed, and they said, "Well, how many wounded?" And they were, "Don't know. I don't know." And um, uh, so they learned that 50 had been killed. Um, this was brought up in Parliament in the United Kingdom in May by Anthony Eden, and he returned to it a month later in June 1944. And in June 1944, he said that the British government would hunt down those responsible for having committed these crimes. And that is precisely what happened. Uh, so when the war ended, there's a special investigations uh, uh, branch of the Royal Air Force was set up. And uh, there was uh, somebody from the from the Metropolitan Police, somebody from Blackpool Police, and they had uh, below them they had I think it was 17 NCOs and they then started looking for these uh, the criminals or the, the Gestapo had actually done it and what happened was um, in um, uh, they managed to track down quite a lot of them um, as early as September 1944, uh, there was one person who was actually, he was in the, what was called the London Cage POW camp, and he was questioned, and he proved to be particularly forthcoming. Not only that, it needs to be pointed out that nearly everybody on, on the, Ger all the German side who was uh, to, uh, POWs, uh, they were more than happy to talk uh, if, they, if they had anything to, to actually say. There was very few that uh, didn't talk at all. Um, many of them are now okay. They've lost uh, the war's been lost, but but they uh, had anti-Nazi feelings. It was only the hardcore Nazis who actually didn't want to actually talk. Now, so then people started to get get arrested. Uh, now, in um, there was a, an escape route which uh, went. Was, most people have heard of the Southern Rat Line. That's where I usually using the Vatican and it was, but there was also a northern rat line some of them went south some of them went north Johannes Post uh, in June 1944 he'd been put in charge of a camp it was called a labor uh, sorry an um, education labor camp uh, well effectively it was a concentration camp but uh, as far as the prisoners was gone but administratively it was an education labor camp in this camp between four and five thousand people passed through uh, approximately uh, 400 of whom were didn't survive the camp and that was of course was the responsibility of the commander commandant who was post uh, Schulzer, his, his former boss, was the person who gave the orders. He, in fact, set the camp up. Uh, Post tried to escape. He changed his name. He was picked up uh, near Minden, uh, which is to the west of Hanover. And um, he was put in a camp there. The uh, people who were doing the, the search uh, for these, the, 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 those that killed the people from the Great Escape, uh, were informed about it. Somebody went to the camp at Minden with a photograph. He recognised him, and he was then placed under arrest. He was then taken to London, where he was interrogated. I don't quite know whether they didn't interrogate him in Germany. Maybe somebody in, in didn't like the sausages or something. But anyway, he took him to to the UK. Uh, he was then. It was a Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Scotland who uh, interrogated him. And he said uh, this Johannes Post, uh, he was the second worst person he'd ever had the mispleasure to uh, interrogate. He acted very arrogantly when, they, when he was sure that, he, he, not only that, the way he spoke about, yeah, sure, I killed them the same as ways I killed the, uh, killed the others in the camp. And the ones, those I killed in the camp were, 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 uh, had no meaning for me any more than these uh, pilots had any meaning for me so that was the um 
that was the way he was. It seems as though Mr. Post actually got beaten up, uh, or at least he was assaulted by uh, one of the, uh, the sergeants um, there. Anyway, so he came back, uh, sent back to Germany. Uh, he was um, put on trial. Uh, he was found guilty uh, alongside, a, I think it was 13 others. Uh, 30 of them all together and uh, who were um, sorry more than that were found guilty I think it was 17 were found guilty but 13 were sentenced to death and he was hanged in Hamlin prison in, 19, uh, in 19, February 1948 uh, now um, now the point of this um, uh, rather uh, lo long lecture on this is one thing I would have to say is this is that we in the Second World War I often know most of the stuff I talk about things like uh, Holocaust uh, Einsatzgruppen and things of this nature when we're talking of tens of thousands uh, if not hundreds of thousands of deaths and often uh, we have people like Martin Sandberger whom I did a, uh, quite a long video on who uh, responsible for the deaths of around 90,000 people and he ends up uh, in a retirement home in Stuttgart and he died only 13 years ago uh, paying 2,000 euros a month for his uh, uh, food and board there so um, uh, got these huge amounts of when where people hardly anything's done to stop them but in the case like this when it was british pow's who were killed uh there's a huge effort is made to try and find those responsible and it really was a huge effort you've got to bear in mind that those responsible were scattered all over the place uh it was hard to find them uh we don't have the technology we have today and even then uh, the tech the technology wasn't as easy as it had been say before the war because every the communications and everything was intact so it was a huge effort that was put in into finding and successfully finding the majority of the criminals there's only two or three that actually were not uh, actually traced and um anyway um so uh that is a little point there and uh, i'm not a nationalist under any in any way but um, that is, does make the point for Zionism in as much as that if Israel or if there had been a Jewish state, then maybe somebody uh, would have acted to do something for the, uh, the Jews who were killed. Indeed, had there been a Soviet state which cared about its citizens, then maybe somebody would have actually done something about that uh, as well. Anyway, good. So let's have a look at some of the questions here and I'll have a go. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, John says, Nova did a show on the real Great Escape. Uh, it was on PBS. They uh, excavated the area of the camp. Yeah, I've been to the camp, actually. Um, I have some photographs I think, on my Facebook site. Uh, this is before I started making films. I haven't been back there since I was there. When was it? 2004, I think it was. And... Um, it, it's i think the memorial is very good and i do I, I know that it's been actually done up since then now there's one thing i do want to say about the prison of war camp is is that all all the concentration of course is on uh these 50 uh, uh western uh, airmen pilots who were killed but who is often forgotten are the thousands of soviet uh pow's who were killed there uh or who were allowed to die who were not fed who were starved or died of uh, malnutrition or starvation related illnesses they are totally forgotten in this and uh, so i would uh, would like to m mention that uh, as well and uh, right so uh, yeah john says that schultz knew nothing yeah probably was that schultz from hogan's heroes i haven't seen hogan's heroes uh, so i don't know uh, uh, hello colin uh now uh, john says sandberger was helped by himmler's daughter I don't think she was. I think you know, I don't know. You think of them, Goering's daughter, maybe, because she was the one involved in the um, Stille Hilfe uh, uh, organization, which sort of. But but having said that, Sandberger got a job uh, through his old school contacts, and uh, that was what uh, uh, he had. As soon as he came out of prison, 1957, he had a job to go into. Um, and um, I need to do something on, on, on German prosecutions as well, uh, but not now. <laughs> and 
Uh, so Conte was, it was in Poznan at the, at the Commonwealth uh, Cemetery a week ago. Paid my respects to the fallen. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> I, I was in that. Uh, actually, I was in that once. Uh, in, and there was this priest came in and he said that this cross is the symbol of our... What did he say? The symbol of our... I can't remember what it was now. But anyway, I, I reject... I, I said to him, no, you're wrong there. That um, Because um, if I... I, 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 I I'm not... I'm a... I'm a non-believer, but if I had been killed in the war, I'd want to be in the cemetery as well. And the and the priest said, "Yes, you know, that's a very good point. Yes, I, I agree with you on that." Anyway, that when that was in Poznan, that would have been '95, something like that. I lived in Poznan actually for two years. Um, so uh, Himmler's daughter was the head of an organization that helped. No, that's not Himmler. That's Goering's daughter, John. Uh, still a Hilfe um that uh, um she was uh, uh himmler himmler's daughter in fact one of him uh, um, gudrun himmler is is jewish uh that would that that would have that would have wound up wound him up and um uh, she married an israeli guy and uh, she converted uh, gudrun is the uh daughter of himmler's brother uh so it was uncle unc he was the uncle uh, anyway, she wrote a book, but I found the book somewhat difficult to actually. Um, I think I've still got it in London, actually. Uh, but, but I found it rather hard going. Anyway, um, so good. That's uh, so that's something about the the Great Escape and um, uh, Autumn. Hey, maybe I ought to do some more films as well. So I've said how good the said how good the Great Escape film was, and how good Mussolini and I was. I'm ought to say something. Um, about one or two other, other other films as well. How great Downfall is! I keep mentioning that one as well. Downfall, the best film, the best war film, uh, I think, ever, uh, in my opinion. Uh, okay, so Heinrich's daughter. Okay, I'll, I'll uh, um, okay, I'll, I'll look, I'll, 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 I'll take your word for them. Um, yeah, no, no, lots of the daughters were. There's a book called, I think, Gerald Posner wrote a book. Uh, which I bought in Poznan uh, in '94, um, so um, Hitler's children or something like that, and uh, where there was interviews with the with with the children. There was only one uh, who was really didn't like his parents, and that was the son of uh, the, uh, the 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 governor of Poland, Hans Frank, and his his son wrote a book. I read three pages of it, and uh, I I couldn't continue. It was. It, it was uh, I bought the book as well. I bought it, and then I did. I only read three pages, and I gave it away. It, it, I thought it was just. It was just some kind of uh, this expressions of hatred, but but it was. It was done such a perverse way, and I thought, oh, I can't. I can't, I can't read that. Um, uh, ha uh, Hans Frank's uh, was another son as well of his who uh, didn't clearly didn't like him, but he, he didn't like him as. Uh, little as the son who was born in 1928. Good. What? Gudrun died? Really? I didn't know that. I mean, she wasn't very old. Um, I don't. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Gudrun Himmler. Okay. Well, sorry. I am. Um, oh, I'm sad to hear that. Okay. Very good. So, thanks so much for watching. I'll um, tomorrow. No, tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow I have a video. It took me three months to do it. Uh, mind you, I wasn't working on three months, but uh, I, I finished it. I finished it here about um, ten days ago, and uh, I dictated it in uh, in Germany when I had some peace to do actually dictation because I can't really dictate anything here. Because uh, I do it now, I've got sort of cars and things and boats and all sorts of other noises and church bells. Uh, and, I, and when I get up early in the morning, I've got to get really, I've got to get up before the birds start singing because I've got the seagulls squawking. That's about four o'clock. Uh, makes it makes it difficult to actually record anything. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, yeah, so Collins says the Poles have done the great escape just as at, Sag at Sagan, Jagan uh, now. Um, Okay, so thanks very much for being here and watching and all the best from me in Poland. So bye for now.